Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. With my guest on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technological discovery that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, episode I'm joined again by Eric V. Stax. He's a cannabis farmer in Northern California and an incredible Bitcoin content creator. So I'm super excited to talk with him again and jam together about different Bitcoin topics. And we're doing it live. Welcome, man. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. It's awesome good to, to... Uh, see you again after uh, our time together in Madeira. Yeah, man. How did you find that? So I went to Pacific Bitcoin in October. That was the first Bitcoin gathering that I had been to. It was actually the first time that I had been around any other Bitcoiners in real life or in meat space. Mm. Um, and at the time, I hadn't posted anything on Twitter, so nobody knew who I was or anything. And so it was kind of a very surreal experience being around so many like minded individuals and then getting feedback from people who have like watched some of my content and like making these connections in the real world with people that I've like been messaging back and forth with. Like, you're one of them. Um, it was a powerful experience. The energy is so incredible at these with with bitcoiners especially when you put so many of them in one space everybody is happy and optimistic and healthy yeah. it's really a, a a very energizing empowering and like motivating social gathering it really yeah. is it's on another level yeah yeah man i loved it too i think i think you have the same experience right like that you're like IRL circle is very small like your real life circle is very small yeah. like people you actually talk uh talk with about about bitcoin and i have exactly the same actually my first conference was in amsterdam like late last year and i had the exact same feeling like i just went alone and i went to a talk of rational root i think and i was just standing there and it was packed like i was standing in the back in the hallway and i was like wow this is like all these people are into the same thing you know, and, and I never realized that there were so many people, you know, even though maybe there's like a thousand or two thousand people walking around or something. It's just already way bigger than what I experienced before. And of course, we have like online an audience and that's hundreds or sometimes thousands of people, you know, who listen. But that is it's different. It's 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 really different when you feel like the real energy with real people. And especially for me, the, that first talk of Jack Mahler's. Um, yeah, in Madeira, it was like, I'm going to explain Bitcoin, he said, and I thought, well, I know this, I know this stuff. But honestly, that was maybe the best Bitcoin explainer I've, I've seen in the past 10 years. And you could feel the energy of the people like, wow, OK, look at this guy talk and, and how he was transmitting his energy. You know, like, how, how did you feel that? I think it's um, there's something there where like you with Bitcoin, you always have to maintain this air of humility. You got to you got to expect that you're going to learn something new or you're going to learn the next layer. You're going to go deeper, deeper into the rabbit hole. And if you don't maintain that air of humility, like you'll get wrecked, even if it's in like, hey, I missed out on listening to Jack Mahler say something that was really important and thought provoke provoking because I thought I knew he was going to say something that or I thought I knew what he was going to say. And so. Yeah, I always, I, you know, I, I maintain that humility. And I think it's also important in life, at least for me, to, to, to keep in mind that at any point, at any time, everything that you ever thought was true or you believed could completely be shattered and disrupted. Yes. It's like the, it's the, <laughs> it's like the anti cognitive dissonance, right? And like mm. maintaining that is I think very important and it keeps you open, it keeps you malleable, it keeps it so that you can continue to learn. And I think, and it's actually like in normie land, I find that the people who are the hardest to talk to about Bitcoin are the most educated because they mm. develop this hubris and this idea that like they've got it all figured out and they can explain the nebulous, ambiguous Keynesian bullshit lie. And it's all you could never understand. And like, so I just find that like, I don't know, just being open to the notion that like you're about to learn something new at any point mm. from anybody, I think is a very important thing. You know, otherwise we end up like really stifling the flow 
uh, of, of knowledge and experience in life as soon as you, you know, kind of make the decision that you've got it all figured out. And so, you yeah. know, I think that was a great example with Jack Mauler's. Oh, I'm going to explain Bitcoin. I'm sure half the people were like, oh, okay, I'm going to start tweeting or start, you know, I'm going to walk out and get breakfast. And then there he just drops the heat, dude, on a whole mm. new level. So, yeah. I love it. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really wanna ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I wanna thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really wanna ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Yeah, 100%. But I also, I, I think what you said, it is the cognitive dissonance and the comfort people find in not not leaning into that right probably unconsciously as well right like subconsciously yeah. in a sense that they they feel the resistance like in some way they they listen to you because they have a first impression of you you know when you when you talk to people like okay this is maybe a smart guy or he's enthusiastic about bitcoin or something but then at one point along the conversation something triggers them that closes them down right? instead of leaning into it like okay you know, I know that I don't know everything. And so it's yeah. actually interesting and fun to hear this other person out and see how that can help me maybe change my mind or think better or learn something, like you said. And just, I don't know, like, I also feel lucky a bit. Like, I am like that, you know, I like to learn stuff. I like to dig into stuff. So I, 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 I do understand that it is a certain personality trait, but like the total other side of that like actually today i was on linkedin i got into this discussion like i shouldn't have done that but you know there's people that are so aggressively wrong about bitcoin that i am like i'm i'm i feel empathetic as in like i would love to save you but i cannot save you and and save saving those people is not even about you have to buy bitcoin but more like please understand that you are wrong like you're argument is just so flawed you're getting worked up over something you have no idea about and once you recognize that it's probably cognitive dissonance it could that could help you you know whatever your actual understanding of bitcoin will be or your actual eventual um you know judgment about it but currently you know your critique is not informed you know it's just yeah, it's yeah just... and those people actually they don't bother me anymore and i i don't i don't get i don't have that feeling of like oh i gotta help these people bitcoin is helping them they'll learn in time and actually just the existence of bitcoin and the fact that people are buying bitcoin is making the no coiners lives better the fact that i don't own any real estate like bitcoin didn't exist like i would be buying rental properties. I would be mm. levering up that equity to go buy more rental properties because that's how you accelerated your position within the old paradigm, the old world, the a, a, a BB before Bitcoin, and now we're <laughs> AB after Bitcoin. Yeah. And so, you know, when people are like, oh, you're going to miss the boat and like, oh, I'm just trying to save people. Bitcoin is saving them. Bitcoin is making their lives better. Mm. And Bitcoin is like, in some sense, the one of the greatest teachers, this protocol. This protocol is teaching us so much about how the world works through such a clear lens. Um, yeah, so I don't get too into it anymore. I used to really exert a lot of energy. Like I've had several ongoing long debates with people about oh, just all the things that we all kind of talk about when we're attempting to orange pill people. And the more and more I've thought about it and the more and more I've thought about, like, is the government going to try to seize the coins? We're going to have a 6102. Is like Bitcoin a threat? And the more and more I think about it and not in some like delusional state, I've just further developed a thesis that I cannot dispute that Bitcoin makes everything better for everybody. 
including the nation state, including the banking bloodlines, including the no coiners. And I kind of am like letting go of this, like, I don't know, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't have any fear around it. Like, I don't think they're going to come and try to steal our Bitcoin. It doesn't make any sense. Like, and I have, I could go on and on and on about all the reasons why I, I've evolved my perspective there. Yeah. Um, well, let's yeah, do that you know, because this was one of the things I wanted to talk about. So yeah. one of the things I wrote down is, will Bitcoin be banned or confiscated by governments? So let's let's talk about that, you know, banning yeah, versus adopting it, it and, and then yeah. the game theory there. So just, you know, as short or yeah. long as you want. All right, well, first off, it is game theoretic, right? And on a mm. ma- I believe that on a macro level, there's actually more market competition. It's more tumultuous than, tumultuous than it is on a micro level. On a micro level, if you and I are competing over a business deal, we're not going to start shooting bombs at each other if we get disagree. On a macro level, if you have trade wars, trade wars evolve into real wars if, if, the, if the trade war isn't solved, right? And so... Mm. Fair trade is something that we want. The rest of the world is obviously getting sick of the fact that the United States prints dollars out of thin air and then sends them overseas. And then these these other countries or marketplaces are sending us real world goods and services. And one of the another thing that I really liked, actually, Michael Saylor said in Madeira, is he goes, the government's selling Bitcoin into the open market that was seized. So the United States government is very... Yeah fragmented and they have all these different departments and they don't interface and and work very well it's become this kind of inefficient i don't know it's like this feedback loop of more regs more regulators more fees and so it's very fragmented and so you have some yeah. departments where hey you know there was law enforcement issues and the government sees these coins and they're selling them into the open market and then there's a lot of dialogue around the etfs the etfs are gonna bring in all these coins uh, Coinbase is the custodian for most of them. It's this huge honeypot. Well, okay, let's think this through. If the United States government says, hey, 61, 6103, so we've got a new, <laughs> a new, new executive one. bill, we're going to confiscate all these coins. Well, if they pull them from the ETFs and then they say, hey, you're a felon if you don't send us your coins. First off, like I have friends that legitimately lost the keys to their Bitcoin. So what are you going to do? Go around and detain these people and send them to a key extraction camp and just waterboard them for perpetuity (laughs) until they die? Because they can't even give you the keys because they legitimately don't have them. I know somebody who has a lot of Bitcoin that they bought really early on and they can't find the keys and it's going to bug them for the rest of their life unless they find the keys. Wow. So that doesn't make any sense. That's not energy efficient. But if they did seize the coins, they say, hey, to the 11 ETFs, like, look, we got all of these money issues. You need to give us all the Bitcoin. Well, unless the government was going to use the Bitcoin as a reserve to issue more dollars against, then it doesn't have any value, right? So if you're going to seize the Bitcoin and you can't spend the Bitcoin, then why are you going to seize the Bitcoin anyways, right? And so let's also layer on top of that, you're talking about the government or the well, central you, you bank that- have a use case, you mean? Yeah, well, what's the point of it? You're going to just take mm-hmm. it all off the market? And here's another thing I think most people don't think enough about, and I think it'll be more of a commonly discussed idea or notion, is Bitcoin makes fiat better. I believe that we're in for B-locks. All of these monetary units are getting lent into existence as debt against assets, right? So they're printing money into thin air. If I go to the bank and I say, here's 50,000 US shitty dollars, here's my down payment, I want to buy this $500,000 house, the 450 grand that, that... they lend me for the mortgage gets printed into thin air digitally mm-hmm. it gets created it gets created in, out of thin air at that time so and it's also jeff booth's work like he's you know talking about you know the we live in a deflationary world but the inflationary monetary system requires the dollar denominated value of everything within the marketplace to go up well if they have this debt crisis that we all know they do it's 11th grade math like greg foss says it's 11th grade math. We know that they have to continue to expand the monetary units within the system, and it, it's happening at seemingly an exponential rate. Well, the inflation goes into the marketplace in different sectors within the marketplace at different rates, right? Yeah. And so if they continue to debase and lend that money into existence as debt against equities in these large megacorps and then real estate, the large megacorps become more contillionaire megacorps. It's more of a centralizing force. And then the real estate 
creates this feedback loop where the cantillionaires continue to go buy more real estate and the price of housing and rent is going to go through the roof. Then the government has to step in and put in rent controls. But if the bond, if the inflation moves into Bitcoin, that's not hurting anybody. If Bitcoin mm. goes from 100 grand a coin to 10 million a coin over a decade because they printed so much money, that doesn't hurt anybody. But if rent over a five year period goes up 5x, people are going to be fucking homeless. Landlords are going to go bankrupt because they can't pay their mortgages because the, the states or the, gov- the, the federal government is going to put in rent controls. So the, gov- the landlord can't raise his rent, but his cost of operating his business is going up. So I believe that what's going to take place is actually they're going to roll out the orange carpet for us. They are going to lend against Bitcoin. Here's another thing, actually, too. Why would they seize the Bitcoin if they can just print? Like if the government, if the of central course, bank, that's the whole point, if, right? Then they, right, if the, then if the, that, the, that's uh, capitulation, basically, right? They uh, give yeah, in but to here's the kicker. Of course, yeah. If the central bank says, "Hey, you know what? We have a B lock available to everybody who has Bitcoin in the ETF or in self custody. You need to send the coins to us, and we're going to loan you ten percent, thirty percent, whatever the LTV is, right?" Mm-hmm. The banks now get possession of the coins and then they mint new U.S. dollar into existence. And then people who own Bitcoin can go be cotillionaires in the society. They can borrow against the ever increasing equity that they have in the Bitcoin. And that fact that they're doing it isn't contributing to homelessness. The fact that they're spending more monetary units into the system is it's bolstering up fiat, but it's allowing a transition to take place where the debt is now backed by Bitcoin and not assets. And that's not hurting anybody. And then Bitcoiners who typically are going to vote with their dollar for higher quality things are going to now fund the ethical high value things within the marketplace. And then the Bitcoin price rips because the, they're debasing against the Bitcoin instead of housing. And so, so you say, just, wait, 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 as, as a summary. So you say we basically inflate Bitcoin to prevent yes. all the other stuff to be inflated. Correct. Yes. Mm. And that doesn't hurt anybody, including people who don't hold any Bitcoin. That doesn't hurt them. It actually helps them because their rent doesn't go up 5x. If Bitcoin shreds and rent doesn't and real estate mm-hmm. doesn't, then what's the problem? So this this does align with the thesis of print more of your infinite money and buy Bitcoin, like to a degree. But you yeah, say, but, but, the but, but this is a different that... version. This is a yes. different version, right? But instead so you say of we... printing and then yeah. buying the Bitcoin and keeping the Bitcoin, they're printing and they're giving those monetary units to Bitcoiners within the free market who get mm-hmm. to then use, for example, let's say you have a handful of coins and Bitcoin hits a 1M, right? Like so... Uh, Samson Mao was right. One dot zero zero M. We say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no. Let's just say it's it's one M yeah, per yeah. coin. It's eighteen months from now, and let's say you have five coins. Mm. So if you give one coin to J.P. Morgan Chase and Jamie Diamond, Diamond, I promise you knows how to s- pronounce Satoshi's name, and I promise you he's read the white paper a million fucking times. This is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. So. 18 months from now, you got a million dollar coin. Let's say you own a couple of them, one of them even, whatever. You give that coin to JP Morgan Chase, you send them the coin, and then now you get to borrow 20% LTV. You get to borrow $200,000 against that coin. If that coin is appreciating at 20% a year annually, you accrue $200,000 in equity every year, and you can borrow a percentage of that newfound $200,000 in equity, and you could go spend that money into the marketplace. Being a Bitcoiner, typically we have a much longer time preference, a time horizon. We think more long term. We want to buy things that are more quality. We're not typically buying the cheap, shitty widget made in China. We're typically not buying beef that's grazed and where used to be old rainforest that's been cut down and by cows fed glyphosate laden roundup laden corn right we're buying local grass-fed beef we're buying all this nice stuff so that's good for the marketplace if we're voting for the dollars and we're borrowing against the bitcoin it creates a new contillionaire class but here's the real kicker jp morgan chase now has possession of your coin and unless you pay back that 200 grand that you borrowed against the one million dollar bitcoin 
they hold the coin. And so in some sense, like that gives you them the ability. I mean, literally it gives them the ability to get possession of coins. And it also gives freedom within the existing system to people who have coins. And the fact that that debasement is taking place and the debt is getting lent against Bitcoin, which is invisible. I've referred to it as metaphysical. It's property. It's matter in cyberspace. It's like the merging of the physical and the metaphysical world. It's the, it's this invisible substance that is finite. And if you debase against that, the fact that people are hoarding it and you're debasing against it isn't hurting people within the physical world. And it's like, once again, I love so much of Jeff Booth's, Booth's work where you have abundance in money, you create scarcity and everything else. People short the money and they go long cars and houses and whatever, right? Look at Venezuela mm -hmm. or Zimbabwe. I was watching a documentary last night. Dude, people were literally, they're changing their wages by the end of the day. You don't even put prices on menus because by the end of the day, the price has changed, right? And so it means that you got to you gotta have anything that holds the value better than the money. Well, where you have scarcity and money, you create abundance and everything else. I'd rather have Bitcoin than anything else within the marketplace. And yeah. if I wanted to, I don't know, real, let's also let's get real. Like most people are tired. The road to serfdom is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. You know how many people would be like, yo, I'll give up a fraction of my Bitcoin to borrow a little bit of shitty USD so I can go into the marketplace and buy what I need and get to relax a little bit. And so then the central banks get the coins and then they can lend against the coins that could fractionally reserve again, you know, against coins that it's bringing solvency back into an insolvent system. It changes the incentives with the account changes, uh, accounting practices changing at the end of the year. Nestle, as an example, is going to stack sats instead of go drill a well in some area where people are starving and thirsty and broke and sell the water back to them. We live in a world of you want to exert the least amount of energy to get the most in return. And the reason that people behave, the corporations behave the way that they would do, the reason BlackRock has the financial strategy that it has is just because of the fiat system, not because BlackRock is full of some sociopath. Maybe they are. I don't know. But it's not because these guys are scumbags per se who get their jollies off on plunder. It's because mm -hmm. it's just how you got the most. Like we all have a friend who's got an uncle who owns 30 rentals. When you sit down with them at the barbecue, do you sit there and tell him he's a shit bag because he's contributing to homelessness? No, but we all shit on Larry Fink because he's buying up all the single family homes. Oh, I, you know, I get that. It's unethical. Second and third order effects aren't, that aren't good. But yeah. now to acquire the most, it also it's the least energy to exert as well. It's like you just stack the sats. And yeah. so. Yeah, it's better for BlackRock if you and I have coins in self-custody. It's better for the United States government if I have coins in self-custody. It's better for the EU if you have Bitcoin in self-custody. And I think that people are figuring this out at hyper rate. It's just the vortex of incentives. The, the banks, the central banking bloodlines, they can acquire coins because they currently control the financial system. And why would they try to confiscate the coins when they could just lend fiat against it and they would yeah. get a decent percentage of it and i do also have experience with regulators trying to come in and regulate an existing multi-billion dollar industry with cannabis and so i kind of think it's laughable listening to some of the narrative with the united states government trying to come in with these ridiculous rules with bitcoin they're it's not going to work they're going to go well, back to the drawing board and they're going to come back with favorable rules like rationally i i agree um, but I do wonder, like this, this problem is so big and the system is so fragile, like definitely not sound and resilient. <laughs> oh, I love, yeah. I love those words. So I could also imagine that the narrative for the opposite of what you are saying, you know, th this is obviously such a threat to this already fragile system so we should outright ban it like i don't think that's a good choice but i like at, at one point it's going to become clear for hopefully everyone who can do something about it like inside of the government that it, this this is really like a a, a a breaking system right 
It's not a I don't, threat. Bitcoin's a solution. I understand. I understand. Yeah. But I mean more just to draft just a to resolution. Just to steal man the thesis. Yeah, yeah, just to draft a resolution and say like, okay, like if everyone is going to, you know, switch their USD for Bitcoin, then we have a problem. And you already see that a bit, of course, right? Like they're closing the doors in, diff- in different countries, actually. You know, certain banks don't allow you to buy stuff on Coinbase. Um for example, you cannot even take money in most countries out of your retirement account just because it's not there, right? Um, and so, like, although I agree with you, I do wonder, like, if if someone like, let's say, Elizabeth Warren with her, well, I hope she gets replaced, but anyway, you know, with a shitty resolution, get some sponsors um, that that she can get that through, like, it... it 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 would be a dumb decision, but it wouldn't surprise me, right? Because not not everyone, even in a government, actually understands, you know, that the fiat system, especially in America, I think we all look to America, so we take that as an example, because it's the best currency, but uh, this is the shape that it's in, you know? So if America, if America's fiat system falls, then the rest will follow anyway. So it's more like, okay, I love the rational thought, but I wonder... I wonder if relevant people realize that in time, you know, and then I do agree. It could be a lifeboat basically to keep the fiat system from actually breaking down. And then you kind of like buy time without hyperinflating actual things that actual people use, like the food, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, because obviously that will lead to civil unrest and, you know, even worse outcomes right so yeah and i love that bitcoin is so ironical in a sense right that it it if this plays out like you say and it would be a lifeboat for a fiat government and that is like pure poetry right (laughs) that is just amazing yeah i think there's gonna be a lot of fud and distraction though and i do think that they're gonna try to keep people out of it and i you know what comes to mind when you say hey you know like yeah they're preventing people from moving all their money out of their retirement accounts and into bitcoin and some jurisdictions are preventing people some banks are preventing you from buying on Coinbase and so on. Mm. That makes logical sense to me. But that means to me that these people who have that benefit and have control over the current system, if you will. Um, yeah, they want to slow that down and they want to get a position. But like, let's all get real. This is like a this is a game of musical chairs or everybody's rushing into this new system. And it is a survival of the fittest Darwinian type thing that is taking place. But it's still making things better for people who are in the fiat world and stuck in the fiat world. Is it not fair and that, that they can't just easily sell down their retirement account and put all their money into Bitcoin. Yeah, of course. Sure. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. like not fair, but Bitcoin is slowly bringing truth. It's slow. I actually, I would say it's happening quite fast. It's bringing truth. It's bringing fairness. It's bringing solvency into an insolvent, unfair system full of lies. And so mm. it is making it better every day. And for everybody, no coiners and coiners. And so... I just think that over time, the or the end destination is not a sixty one oh two. It's not camps eating bugs. But I also believe that we are being there is a mass psyop taking place. This is this is my my conspiracy belief. You could say, if I was the United States government, or if I was a banking bloodline, or if I'm the Federal Reserve personified, what would I do? I'd tell Gary G to shut his fucking mouth. And not tell the yeah. world that he's going to sue every unregistered security that exists. And I would let the plebs get wrecked buying dog coins in Solana and Ethereum and whatever other garbage, right? It's the only way to dilute Bitcoin. And then me, in the meantime, I'd let all my trust and all my insu- institutions and the ETFs yeah. and then the Buy big it. large corporations <laughs> stack like a motherfucker. And then mm-hmm. once again, I, this ties into like Samson Mao's Omega Candle thesis. I think he's right. Like I don't talk about the price in my videos really. I, I think it's maybe the most it's the most important, but kind of the least fascinating thing about Bitcoin. It goes in line with the it's the the worst way the best thing could happen, right? 
And instead of Bitcoin liberating 5 billion people from poverty over a 20 year period, I think that the price is going to blast through the roof. A bunch of plebs got wrecked buying dog coins. And then the mainstream media and the government's going to continue to lie and gaslight everybody. And they're going to tell them when it crashes from 2.5 million to 1.8 million, it's too volatile for you plebs. You don't want to hear this anyways. (laughs) In the meantime, all the ballers are just stacking hard. And so I do think that we're in for some really interesting stuff taking place in the future. But also, and maybe I'm grading on a curve. Maybe the old world... Maybe the world BB before Bitcoin was so bad that I'm looking at how Bitcoin is making things better and I'm grading and I'm just grading on a curve. I'm like, ah, you know what? It's still making it better for everybody. But actually, once again, it's just it steps in the right direction. I think that humanity and our civilization is moving in the right direction in such an interesting and beautiful way because of this incentive vortex. And it's like, you know, once again, too, like uh yeah, matt crowder with bitcoin university i love his videos i watch all his videos shout out to matt crowder he did a video the other day about like is blackrock gonna fork bitcoin oh funny like wait the, like... wait wait to add to add to that yeah. this is also one of the things yeah. that i saw and wanted to talk about you know s- someone said you know all these financial institutions that are buying uh bitcoin you know they're gonna rug us and sell it at a certain point where i think like you're obviously misinformed because it's the yeah. the people who buy the etfs right anyway let's tie it into this like yes yes what are so those big bad note, institutions gonna do <laughs> yeah so we're talking about a global a global protocol okay that yeah. a significant amount of the coins are distributed throughout the entire world. So you can't ban Bitcoin. You can only ban yourself from Bitcoin. Look at what China did. China tried to ban all the miners. Probably a fucking mistake for China, honestly. We all know mm-hmm. that. And so if the government dumped all their, or if the ETFs, let's use BlackRock as an example. If, the, if BlackRock tries to fork it or dumps all the coins they got what what is blackrock alone has 210,000 i believe someone i was chatting with last night said 4 to 5% i could be wrong but let's just say hypothetically it is 5% of the coins are held by the 10 etfs 10 or 11 i think gbtc is i think it's now up. almost 900k or something ish i don't know i, I cannot get yeah, that so quickly, uh, it's yeah. it's a it's a significant let's just call it 5% if all four-ish, of them band together yeah. and dumped all those coins under the market People all over the world, Michael Sailors of the world, plebs like you and I, we're just going to buy. Are you kidding me? It mm. only hurts them. And so that's, I believe, I believe that idea is a silly, silly thought process if you look at it through yeah. this lens. Black it's Rock, the cognitive dissonance at, again, right? Like, well, why, let's look why, at Larry why, Fink. Why would Larry Fink is literally the most successful asset manager on planet earth he's a and i don't know anything about this guy other than he's got he's the head of blackrock right he may be unethical in his ways i fucking i don't know he could hang out with epstein in the past i don't fucking know let's put all that aside let's just look at his business he is a winner he is the most successful he manages the most successful fund not because he does dumb shit like dump all their bitcoin to crash the price Because he does the right thing to make the most money. And so selling all the coins for a bunch of shitty USD, what's he going to do? Just buy up the rest of the houses in the country? Like, it it just doesn't make any sense. The way to get the most. Because they understand understand what this is 100%, obviously. For sure. But also, Uh, I I think someone asked, like, what what do they, how do they uh, convince their no coiner friends or like how do they deal with the fact that they're trying I had someone asked when you you know a, a question for us in this conversation mm-hmm. um how to reach people outside the reason, of your bubble yeah so i think the reason people don't understand it is for all of known history the path of least resistance to get the most was plunder was to lie cheat and steal and kill Right. It's the game theory. The game theory and the incentive was tilted to violence. And so that that means that hardwired into our biology is for us to not believe and not trust 
that there's an incorruptible thing or protocol. And I love one of the things that Breedlove says that he's the first person I've heard speak to this. And this was kind of back in a couple of years ago. And um, Bitcoin is essentially the discovery of incorruptibility. It's it yes. is it, it is it is hacked human greed for something that's good for everybody. It aligns what's best for the individual, for what's best for the collective. And if you're a sociopath who doesn't give a fuck, who's willing to lie, st- cheat, still and kill, you're even more predisposed to do anything c- to get the most. And now it's buy sats or mine the coins. It's not try to attack the network or try to steal the coins. It's mm-hmm. a trillion times easier. I think Sailor says Total it's a opposite trilli- to comply. Yeah, right. It's yeah. a trillion times easier for my node to deny a false block than it is for a miner to mine a false block. Yes. So to attack the network takes trillions of times more energy than it is to protect it. I think that those numbers apply. It's a trillion times harder to try to steal someone's coins that are popularly custodied than it would be to just try to make a deal with them. Yeah, but uh, I, I think this is one of the biggest things actually people should or could understand about Bitcoin is the fact that this solves our inherent corruptibility. That yeah. is part of what this innovation is, right? If we yes. allow ourselves to accept that even though when we look from afar to someone, right, who is a corruptible, a corrupted person or how, what's her name, Nancy Pelosi is a better trader than, uh, you know, uh, yeah, fucking uh, Buffett, right? That everyone would say like, well, if I would be in a position like this, I would never do that, right? I would never do that because I am a righteous person, person right? But what I think we should all accept is that if we would be in that position and be part of a system that has that is corrupted and we get the opportunity to be part of corrupting it, most people yeah. would probably do it, even though now from a distance we would say we would never do it, right? For sure. Once you accept that, then you accept that if we want to create a system for money or exchanging value, right, it should be an incorruptible system because if it has openings to be corrupted there will be people that will corrupt it for you i mean we're living in it right totally and so once you agree and actually integrate the fact that yes you also are a corruptible person yep and then when you understand that bitcoin is incorruptible that there is more value in following the rules than trying to play the rules, as you just mentioned. Significantly. Yes. By orders of magnitude. But yeah. then your life gets easier because it frees your mind. But also, it is a paradigm shift because in the system that we now live in, I think you just mentioned it a moment moments back, but it's so hard for people to understand because the system we live in is a zero, zero-sum game system like yep. when you when someone else wins you lose etc totally. and bitcoin is not that like bitcoin is a mutually beneficial system if yeah. we uh, um i tweeted a few few weeks ago i hope i can remember but it's like you uh, i think it's like you agree to uh, i have to look it up but it's like you know that all the other users in the system also know that the other users in the system will follow the rules, basically, right? Like yeah. you comply with the rules because everyone who uses it also complies with the rules. There is no way to not comply with the rules and get yeah. value out of it. You can only get value you out, get of the, punished out of it when you... hard if you go against exactly. the rules. Exactly, yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you would do like a 51% attack that basically costs like, I don't know, tens of billions for 10 minutes, then what yeah. do you have? But that's this is what Jason Lowry says, right? Like you totally. can only get yourself out of it instead yep. of if you spent, let's say, ten billion on buying Bitcoin, you probably get more value than trying to yeah. attack it or break it. Absolutely. So it, it, there's no there's no valid like business case basically for yeah. for attacking it. It's only and 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 also and then let's move on to the next topic. But it's also the action versus the words, right? Use like that. That is like the part of the Bitcoin ethos as well. Like people can talk about it, like oh, Bitcoin sucks, blah blah. But we can now say, well, if you are not short Bitcoin, you know, 
shut up basically right totally. and like all the yeah, people yeah. That, that as politicians who talk about banning it or blah 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 like well okay try it like ju- like the, you only talk about it without doing it because that is what works in the fiat world right yeah well it's also but, suppressing the prices keeping a bunch of uh, normies out because they're scared they don't understand also they yes about but, but that is yeah. a fiat world tactic it works in the fiat world but in a bitcoin yeah. world you know it's like okay well you cannot stop me from from acquiring it yep try it you know like actually totally. try it and then yeah i think they will see that it will be way more valuable if they would just follow yeah. it and and that's also in a more global game theory um type way i tweeted about this but i think the first follower of el salvador will actually be a bigger winner than el salvador right because yeah. once let's say Qatar, Oman, or UAE, whatever, really comes out with, you know, we're going to ask for Bitcoin in return for oil. Yeah, Dude, (laughs) like everyone's going to buy and then they probably already have a stack, right? So, yeah, you know, I I I want to see that. I want to see that. (laughs) Me too. Well, it's coming. We all all know it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to add to that before we switch to the next subject. Well, two things, actually. I popped up on my feed the other day on Amazon is Jason Lowry's book, Soft War. So I think the soft war has hit the shelves again. And so that ties into something, though. Bitcoin is not a threat to the United States government. It's not a threat to Russia. It's not a threat to Great Britain or any European countries, the European Union or anything. It's a solution. Governments don't want to be bombed, killed and stolen from. Just like you and I don't want to be debased and stolen from. BlackRock doesn't want to be debased and stolen from. Nobody wants to be debased and stolen from. This is a monumental solution for everybody. I think that we have a lot of distraction. There's a, you could say it's a mass psyop taking place because there's only one way to slow this down, and that's to create some FUD. So anyways. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the price went down. What do we do? <laughs> celebrate be happy are you kidding me yeah Dude, can, can you craigslist an old shitty iphone for 50 fucking shitty us dollars and stack a few stats like jesus yes dude i love it when it's posted it's flying around twitter over the last like couple of days like some of the mm-hmm. some of the hard the, the hardcore maximalists that are talking shit are just like hey is everybody okay are you all right and i could only imagine the mainstream narrative like uh-oh Bitcoin crashed from seventy four grand to sixty six. You don't want any part of this. This is this is terrible. Everybody, go ahead, get out of it. Bitcoin's dead. Bitcoin's dead. Gareth is shorting it again. He's like, yes, I was right. I'm yeah, right. I was right. I'm yeah, put yeah. In more shorts. <laughs> Gosh, dude, wrecked. Oh, oh my goodness, dude. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I I added this to talk about because, as I mentioned, like on LinkedIn, I saw these posts of like financial planners. I help you to uh, get to financial yeah. freedom in uh, two hours. Blah blah. And they were like, "Yeah, look at this. It's not a store of value. It's like, how can this be a real thing?" I, actually, some guy replied to me. He said, "If it's so hard to understand, how can it be globally adopted?" I'm like, "Bro, what? Sorry." <laughs> Well, yeah. anyway. but it's not you know, so it's understand. like that these people come yeah. out when the price goes down you know at, like when the price I goes up you. like all these traditional people say like oh look it's a ponzi it's a pyramid scheme it's a tulip bubble when it they're down they're yeah. like uh yeah see told you so and i think like but it's yeah uh, this is su- don't You're you think indicated this is bo- in that moment <laughs> yeah. but don't you think this is such a boring life like what a yeah, boring I life think... this complaining yeah. well, this like, this uh... this <laughs> It's like the CEO. Did you watch the interview of the CEO of Vanguard before he announced he's going to be stepping down? Yeah, I think that was old, by the way. People tweeted about it, but it was. Oh, not... uh, was it old? Well, it was anyway, recent? but yes, how we talked yeah. about it. It's just like, dude, are you using the cash flow argument seriously? Yeah. Are you using stocks? Like, Bitcoin is a speculative asset, but stocks are not. Dude, you're speculating on the fact that Elon wakes up in the morning and is not dead, totally. right? Tim Cook, same thing. He doesn't smoke thing. a blunt on Joe Rogan, dude. Oh, dude, yeah. He can well, smoke now, a blunt and then all of a sudden he wrecked. Everyone apparently, wrecked. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh. apparently uh, Elon is on some ketamine therapy or something. So I, I read yeah. that today. But uh, the, the simplistic assets or simplistic arguments 
from someone who leads a 1.7 or 3 trillion whatever asset manager like i i my ego comes into play and i think like am i smarter than this dude like probably not but like well, hey, well like what is going on here you know he's trying to protect which i understand but the the like the the segment or the public that he's protecting this for by using these arguments i wonder how big that is because the internet is huge and all the information is yeah. free right so yeah. if someone says oh bitcoin is bad and you're even remotely interested in what happens with your money at vanguard you will mm -hmm. google how does bitcoin work right so it's just it's yeah. a weird it's a weird it's battle. Cognitive bias, I think. I think that his success has been predicated upon a strategy that has worked. BB before Bitcoin, that worked. Like that's that's the Warren Buffett playbook. Yeah. yeah. It's the Warren Buffett playbook. That's cool. Go back to 1960 and then start running your fund and you're cool until today. And now the strategy has changed. As in the famous words of Giga Chad himself, all your models are destroyed. <laughs> there is no second best. Well, yeah. We're going to see when they also capitulate and start offering a Bitcoin stuff. Yeah, they All are. All right. Or they're going to go out of business, dude. Come on. That would be wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Why do people stay stuck in clown world? And can how can we help them, if any? Okay, I got I got a thought on that one. So, as opposed for me at least, this is just my humble opinion and my my experience in my life. As opposed to spending the effort, because honestly, we live in a world where you're channeling energy, right? It's energy in, energy out, and so let's mm -hmm. be laser focused. Let's be energy efficient. Let's not squander our life force doing things that don't produce effective yield or change within the world, right? And so. I have found that instead of exerting all the energy to try to come up with all the great zingers and ideas and things to explain to somebody why Bitcoin is so fantastic, I really distill that down to the most basics. Hey, this is the only thing on planet Earth that as the demand goes up, the supply doesn't change. That and it's a money which has infinite demand because money is a call option on any other good or service that the marketplace produces. So everybody on planet Earth wants whatever the agreed upon money is within the marketplace. And so this thing is basically pairing infinite demand with true scarcity. That and it's metaphysical or it's invisible or it's in cyberspace. It solves the double spin problem so nobody can kill you and steal it. And that's a big deal. And so you could think about that or not. But also then I just lead by example, yeah. like this thing is making my life so much better. If you if you and, and it's just just by being optimistic and positive and like I don't ever tell someone have fun staying poor because that's a big royal turnoff. I don't get into debates over the Democrats versus the Republicans and the fucking the, the, the transgenders versus the, you know, heterosexual. I don't get into any of that stuff. It's just all crazy clown world. And once again, let's look at what Jeff Booth does. This guy is pure motherfucking bliss, dude. I love Jeff Booth. His energy is so inspiring. And he mm. just he says anything that you do to yell at the old world just strengthens it. Energy goes where it. And energy flows where attention goes. Gosh, I can never, I don't know why I can't ever say that. I say it all the time too. So you're just channeling energy into the clown world if you yell at it. And like, if you're trying to inspire people, family members, friends, loved ones, whatever, first off, let's just think about this. They're not missing out. They're just missing out to buy it at this price. They're missing out on a hundred X, a thousand X, whatever. But as long as Bitcoin exists, it's going to appreciate at a faster rate on average than everything else, probabilistically speaking, within the marketplace. So it's always, forever, the monetary investment. There is no second best. You buy it forever. It doesn't matter the price. You go to the marketplace, you earn a surplus, you sweep it into Bitcoin. The sooner people do that, the better off they are. However, and this is where it is kind of Darwinian, if you're hubris because you're a contillionaire who has a multi-million dollar stock portfolio and you have 13 properties and you got a net worth of $8 million and you think this is too good to be true, you get turned on when you hear the CEO of Vanguard validate your broken thesis and you continue to move forward in your life, you're going to feel the economic pain. But that person is also not going to go live on the streets, right? Like they'll be okay. 
their net worth mm -hmm. is going to go down relative to the net worth of Bitcoiners, but also the no coiners who are working nine to five jobs that they're struggling with and they're having their life is getting perpetually harder, denominated in dollars, measured through the lens of the old system, measured within the old system. Their lives are getting better in the old system as the result of the existence of the new system. Because as an example, I sold my house, my 10, I had 10 acres with the house and I had seven acres raw that ended up having multiple greenhouses on it. It was a licensed cannabis farm. When I sold my properties at the end of 2018, after owning these two parcels for two years, I have now put all of my money into Bitcoin. I don't own a rental property. I don't even own the house that I live in. I rent it. That infinitesimally is downward price pressure on housing, making housing more affordable in a very almost borderline immeasurable way, but it is downward price pressure on houses. So yeah. people's lives are getting better. So I lead by example. I try to be cheerful and constructive. Let's look at Sailor's 10 Rules for Life. Be laser focused. Don't dilute your energy. Be cheerful and constructive. And so I don't get all worked up and angry and tell people, hey, you fucking moron, have fun staying poor. I don't yell at the clown world. I defund it with my focus, my energy, and my monetary units. I put them into Bitcoin. And then what happens too is, is that your credibility increases over time as Bitcoin's value goes up. So you'll find that when Bitcoin's 10 grand and you're telling people, hey, I'm buying Bitcoin, you should think about it. And they're like, nah, it's OK. I'm not interested. It's a Ponzi scheme. Well, then when it's 100 grand, they're a little more open to what you're saying. And then it's going to be a fucking million dollars. They're going to be like, dang, this guy was right. Or they're just going to live their whole life in cognitive dissonance and disbelief. Mm -hmm. but, but their lives are still getting better as a result of the fact that people who do understand are stacking sats. And so, yeah, I just, you know, cheerful and constructive. Lead by example, figure out how to distill your sales pitch down to the most fundamental, most important first principles, things, describe the forces. We live in a deflationary world. Supply is always meeting demand as we make things more abundant with the aid of technology. And, and the invent invention of a net is technological advancement over the guy who was fishing with a spear or a pole. So you'll yeah. never stifle people's desire to enhance technologic, technological advancement within our society. As we make things more abundant, we're driving prices down. The larger the margin, the larger the economic incentive, typically the bigger the problem, the more entrepreneurs and capital flow into that sector. They up the supply relative to the demand, satiating that demand, driving its price down. And you can't benefit from those deflationary forces unless you have a fixed unit if you have an inflationary monetary system, you have a moving target. What you want is going further away. Another thing I tell people, too, is, is like, yo, this house that you used to want, what you want this house, it's a million two, it's a million one, it's 600 grand, 500 grand, whatever the price is. Yeah, you realize that like three, four or five years ago, that that house was 100 Bitcoin, 120 Bitcoin, 65 Bitcoin. Well, right now it's 15, it's 20, it's whatever. So measure yeah. the value of the things that you want in Bitcoin. And just lead by example, you know, nobody yeah. wants to be talked shit to. Nobody wants to be berated. Nobody wants to be told they're dumb. Nobody wants to be told to have fun staying poor. That just puts up fucking cognitive walls and blinders and just it mm -hmm. further strengthens the, the divide. The divide yeah. and conquer strategy. That's what the sociopathic overlords that they want. They want us out of each other's necks. Another thing I heard sailors say, uh, you know, the way to win a war is, is, to make other people die for their cause, you know, yeah. you know. And so if you have people fighting against each other all day long, it's a way to, to perpetuate the FUD, keep the price down so that the people who get it can stack, which is yeah. still though making it's the second and third order, fourth order effects of the existence of Bitcoin is still enhancing people's lives, even if they don't own it. And so why is Bitcoin a solution for everyone then? I heard you say that and I loved it, but how how is Bitcoin for everyone literally everyone literally everyone uh well i mean it kind of ties into what i was just saying as so i think about like a good metaphor that i like is 
let's think let's let's think we're squirrels we're squirrels going through the proverbial forests of life trying to gather nuts to survive the winter trying to hedge ourselves against the future uncertainty or the future certainty of being able to not perform at the same level in which you someday you're going to be able you're going to get old and you're not going to be able to climb around the trees as effectively and gather your nuts right you're not going to be able to work as much you're not going to be able to go into the marketplace and be as productive as you are today for example and so if Within the physical world, if you're the proverbial metaphorical squirrel and you're gathering nuts and you're really good at it and you gather all the nuts, there are other squirrels now that don't have access to nuts and they're going to starve and not make it through the winter. And you could say that that's Darwinian and fair enough, whatever, that you can say that that's just the way the world works. And BB before Bitcoin, that was the way the world works. But now that we have discovered matter within cyberspace or this finite instrument, this metaphysical property that's invisible, but it's finite and we can send this informational piece of the hardest substance in the known universe. I send it from me to you. I no longer have it. And now you have it. And it's invisible. It's in the land beyond. It's this invisible thing. If if we hoard this, it's strengthening everybody else's Bitcoin. And it's not unethical. And so you'll never be able to tell the squirrel that's really good at gathering nuts, ethically or unethically. He just goes and pricks another squirrel with a little squirrel sword. Hey, fuck you, <laughs> yeah. I'm taking all your nuts. Okay, well, that's pretty shitty. But, you know, let's say that's just how it is. You'll never stop somebody from being like, okay, so I got one winter's worth of acorns. I'm just going to stop now. No, because you want to continue if you're productive, continue to stack and stack and stack. Maybe you would just want to work for three seasons and save up enough acorns to live the rest of your life. Well, if yeah. you do that in the physical world, you're hoarding things other people need, putting more scarcity on those things. And so, for example, housing is where people have stored most of their value. Real estate, you know, everybody's, oh, they're not making any more of it. Well, they're continuing to subdivide, and you look at how much available acreage there is on planet Earth. It's pretty fucking abundant. It's actually probably as abundant as oxygen is, right? And so really the fact that we have monetized it at the level we have is a result of a broken monetary paradigm. And so hoarding the Bitcoin is not unethical. It's not bad for anybody. It's actually good for everybody, including people who don't own coins today. And someday they will, you know, and if they don't, it's OK, because everything is still being demonetized as a result of the existence of Bitcoin. And so I do believe Bitcoin is good for everybody, including the no coiners. It's good for the government. It's good for it's good for the pleb, the small business. The, you know, the baller that's got a couple houses and lives in a $40 million flat in Miami. It's good for the small corporations, the large corporations, the small nation states, the large nation states. It's good for the banking bloodlines. It's good for fucking everybody. And it's a solution for everybody because everybody has the same game theoretic issue. We don't want to be yeah. debased. We don't want to be stolen from. We don't want to be, you know. Yeah. So I think Bitcoin's good for everybody. I do. All right, so Bitcoin regulations. You have a lot of experience with, you know, within your cannabis career yeah. with regulations. How do you think, if any, the government will try to come in and regulate or, um, yes. you know, ask for more? Like uh, Elizabeth Warren's proposal was actually pretty dumb, I might say. I saw, um, damn, yeah. now I don't know her name, but on Twitter I saw a rebuttal of this woman oh, it's a pity i don't know her name but uh, she went to all the sponsors of elizabeth warren's uh bill or proposal yeah. and explained to them that there are already regulations for all the yeah platforms the crypto platforms in america and they were all shocked because they didn't know so warren totally. duped them into uh yep. sponsoring her basically yeah um but yeah what are your thoughts there regulations so I'll give you a little backstory. In the state of California, in 1996, Prop 215 was passed, which was medical marijuana. And the rules essentially said if you were a qualified patient member of a collective of other qualified patient members, you could share cannabis within that collective. Well, that means that somebody had to produce it, okay? As a result of Prop 215, what ended up happening is, is this multi-million dollar mega industry developed. 
And in 2015, the governor, Jerry Brown, at the time, signed into effect a new bill called MRSA, Medical Marijuana Safety Regulations Act. And what MRSA was, was the regulatory, fra- the most basic regulatory framework put into effect preemptively, knowing that the probability in 2016, when the people voted, I believe it was 2016, it went into effect in 2018, that the people mm-hmm. of California were going to pass recreational adult use cannabis. They were going to, quote unquote, fully legalize it, and the state was going to fully permit and license it. And MRSA, what MRSA essentially said was, is, is in your county, your jurisdiction within the state of California, the county officials could either permit or ban any cannabis activity. So that's going to be cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and retail. And so some counties said, we don't want any of that. And they actually kind of suffered economically as a result of that. That's besides the point. But most counties put into effect a land use ordinance. So this farm, for example, here that I'm in now, is permitted by the county and it received a permit by from Humboldt County before it received a license from the state of California. And the permit issued by the county was via their land use ordinance and it has to do with setbacks, uh, endangered species. There can't be any spotted owl on the property inhabited <laughs> in any of the trees. There can't be any endangered uh, grasslands or wetlands or any sensitive thing. You can't be too close to a creek. I can't have a school too close. No bus. It's kind of like a, a liquor license. You can't just throw a bar up right next door to an elementary school or right yeah. next to a high school, right? And so the county permits the facility and then the entity that has owns the land and owns the permit that's attached to the land gets to apply to the state for a license from the state of California. And then they can lawfully operate within the new legal framework. So when MRSA was signed into effect, Humboldt County hit the ground hard with a land use ordinance. So did a lot of other counties. Humboldt County was the first. At the time, In Humboldt County, there was 12,600 and some odd farms, farms that were visible via Google Maps, not special satellites, not DEA drones, not helicopters with men hanging from them, counting the facilities. These are farms that are determined to be of commercial scale via Google imagery, okay? 12,600 farms. Humboldt County says, here's our land use ordinance. And the state of California also, their regulations were essentially incentivizing through the carrot and the stick. If you come come into compliance and regul- and register your cannabis business and you could prove you're within good standing under the 215 framework in our current existing nonprofit laws, then you're going to get priority for licensure. You will have you will be in the fast lane to get a license from the state of California. And we're also going to stop large corporations from coming in for a period of time. We're going to give you this this grace period in this land of opportunity. Mm. They put into effect a deadline to register your farm out of twelve thousand six hundred some odd farms, one hundred and twenty three farms registered under the first initial, I don't know, regulatory framework that was offered to the marketplace. The cannabis community at large gave the proverbial middle finger to the regulators. And these are people who want to run their farms. They didn't want Mm -hmm. to, oh yeah, we just want to live this rebel outlaw life. You could get fuck work. No, like these are people who are, these are families. These are everyday hardworking individuals who are associated in a market demand, doing something that they believe. 123 out of 12,600 people farms registered within the state of California or within the county. That's just Humboldt County. You know what the regulators did? Instead of sending law enforcement around to farms that you and I could take a tour of right now on Google Maps, I can show you these places. Like, here's the land, here's the parcels. Instead of sending law enforcement around to punish all these people, 
because it's not very energy efficient. But this mm -hmm. is also not a huge land mass. This isn't the whole country. This isn't the whole state. It's some whole county. Instead of sending SUVs and sheriffs and helicopters around, they went back to the drawing board and they came back with much more favorable terms. And so mm -hmm. when I look at the lens, as I look at the proposed regulations in an attempt to regulate Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and self-custody by people like Elizabeth Warren, I think they're absolute fools who have no idea what they're doing. They, you're talking about something that is trillions of times hard, easier to protect than it is to attack, right? So you can't even prove if someone actually has the Bitcoin that they've been sending in cold storage with a different address every time, let alone find their Bitcoin via Google Maps and drive an SUV right up to the <laughs> private keys. Yeah. So, yeah, I understand why there are regulators who are asking for everything. They did it in the state of California. Actually, then they came in and they overtaxed it and they had to drop the taxes, land use or like Humboldt County used to charge a square foot tax for every square foot. You know, you had to pay a one dollar, two dollars or three dollars, depending on what you're cultivating, outdoor, mixed light or indoor. They dropped the taxes. Farms are going out of business. The regulators aren't collecting any money. They keep coming back with more favorable terms because what they wanted was motherfucking preposterous, dude. And it's even yeah. more preposterous to think that they're going to ban self cost How do you even do that? How Charge 30% electrical tax to the miners? Dude, yeah. you know, the United... Texas is going to be up in arms. You know how much money Texas is making right now from Bitcoin mine? It's just crazy. I understand it's... You could say it's a legitimate concern because these regulators are proposing things that are bad for the industry. I don't get too worried about it because I watched the the government come in and try to regulate an existing multi-billion dollar industry with with very prohibitive, excessive rules and regulations. And they went back to the drawing board with the tail between their legs and they came back and they were much more reasonable. And we yeah. had way like orders of magnitude less leverage than Bitcoiners do. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah. So I'm not saying, you know, like I think it's a valid uh, strat strategy for them. I'm just saying, like, I wouldn't be surprised if they would be able to sneak something in. That's more the point, right? Because it's so opaque, yeah. you know, it's less clear than, you know, a cannabis farm that produces this, this yeah. amount and uh, distributes and blah, 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 blah. You know, like, yeah, because no one understands Bitcoin in the government. Most yeah. people don't. You know, it would be easy to create some sort of opaque text that could get sneaked in. That's more the point. But I agree with you. I think the but it would know, get flushed out fast. And, exactly, and because you see the pain is replies life's already. Greatest teacher. The, uh, the United mm. States government would experience some serious pain, and once again, it puts us at a game theoretic a disadvantage against other competing yeah. marketplaces. And so yeah. I just don't even know if it if something would get slipped in. And if it did, I think the rate in mm. which it would get changed is very quick. That, and if you understand Bitcoin, then you could almost be grateful. Oh, Elizabeth Warren came up with some stupid bill. The price plummeted. And then I got to trade my old shitty pickup to a savage who's got some coins. <laughs> and yes. I got cheaper fucking coins, right? It's, it's yes. so... You can't That's ban Bitcoin, mindset. you can only ban yourself from it. And it would just, the economic pain that would take place, it's like BlackRock though. BlackRock is getting paid to manage people's Bitcoin in their ETF account. Yeah. So the economic incentive is to support and go along with the, the network, not to go against it. And I just think that I used to be more concerned about this. And I've just literally, I almost think about how, what kind of, Am I in jeopardy as a result of being a Bitcoin maximalist and having all, literally all of my money is in Bitcoin? So I have a huge incentive to think about this a lot. And I could be wrong. I'm just a dude. It's just my thesis. What the fuck do I mm -hmm. know? But the more and more and more I think about it and the more and more I play out every potential, you know, it's like a chessboard. You're just thinking about every potential move. Every, all roads lead to Bitcoin. I can't think of a, of a, timeline in which bitcoin doesn't make everything better for everybody yeah and, yeah and to end this part we generously invite 
anyone who wants to discuss us on that, right? <laughs> to <laughs> to talk with us, right? I think I would love yeah. to hear. You know, I think it's what Sailor says. There are no informed critiques, and it sounds so arrogant. But I haven't seen any critiques that actually hold up under scrutiny, right? So I, yeah, I would love, I would love to see it, and I, I agree with you. Like because you are literally invested. I mean, I'm in a similar situation. Yeah, this is what we study just for self-preservation first. Totally. And and we share it, I think, enthusiastically with others to hopefully get yeah. them on the same understanding. But uh, but that's the whole point again, I think, in Bitcoin anyway. Like you don't have to trust us. You should trust that we did the work and that should could be the invitation for anyone seeing or listening to this, like to do the same, right? If you yeah. think you 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 have critiques of this. Okay, well, that's a nice leeway, I think, to the next uh Nice segue I want to the to add next one part. One more thing in on that one. Now I'm Go a little. Ex- you could say I'm a little extreme, but I'm actually quite conservative. I'm quite conservative, mm. and I'm not a huge risk taker. And I also look at Same. my my Bitcoin position or allocation is predicated upon the idea that no matter how I slice it and dice it, I don't think Bitcoin goes away. It either goes to infinity or to zero. If it goes to zero or it gets destroyed, we're in trouble anyways. And I'm a motherfucking revolutionary. I'm going to ride this bitch to the fucking end, dude. And I'll take it to zero or I'll take it to infinity because if it goes to zero, we're all toast anyways. And the most effective way to combat the atrocities that are taking place in the world. Like I see homeless people in the local area when I go, dude, it just wrecks me. Seeing dogs and animals on social media getting abused, seeing people get blown up and destroyed, tears me up inside. It's such a deep soul level. I can barely handle it. I'm such a softy. Like once a week, I literally burst out in fucking tears because I know how effective Bitcoin is at combating all of this. And so- Mm. I have an extreme position, you could say, based upon I'm so passionate about affecting change. But I also think this is what's so beautiful. This is where what's best for the individual is what's best for the collective. And you get paid to do the most moral, righteous thing ever. And that's to stack sats. So anyways. Again, this is something I think for lots of people that are not that into Bitcoin yet or not. It's just so hard to understand because they yeah. grow up and we also grew up in this um, yeah. system where that stuff actually exists, right? And everyone says, oh, it, sh- it should not exist, right? Everyone, and you know, protests against certain violence or whatever, but it is about the money. All the things are downstream from the broken money, right? So we can still yeah. feel that we want to change something, but... Yeah, we have to do this. We have to move okay. from this old system, basically, right? And yeah, it's so in- I, I love it when you say this. Like, I, I agree so much. I am the same risk averse control freak person. Yeah, you know? man. And I moved all the way into Bitcoin. Like, it is the best thing to do for yourself, but also for other yeah. people. And God, like, every time I say that, I think, like, oh, that sounds so pretentious and you know but yeah i don't know i am not gonna apologize that uh my mind ended up there you know but yeah. it's it's i i think also a challenge for us to think about how how do we communicate that and how do we invite people to not necessarily again right to join us but to study and see what this could be and that what you said you know and what we talked about before, you can only get value out of it when when you add value uh, to it. And that is just a 180 yeah. from what we currently live in. So and then well, the segue, we want to be winners. Yeah. We don't want to be martyrs. We want to be winners. And if you exactly. have an issue yes. with the atrocity taking place in the yeah. world, you don't need to get behind William Wallace with a sword and go and slice up your opponents. You just move your shitty fucking cuck yeah. bucks, your fiat, your energy out of an old all your dollar derivatives, all of your old BB before Bitcoin monetary instruments. Just move them all into Bitcoin. Sit back, 
enjoy the ride. Well, you just start ignoring it, right? You start totally. you start ignoring the system that affects you in in multiple ways. And uh, by the way, I also agree with what you said. It is either zero or everything. That's always been yeah. my thesis, actually, from the start. And yeah. it is not. It's definitely not going to zero. So it has to be the other thing. Um, yeah. You know, so it, yeah, I, I agree. And that maybe again is also something that when you look at history, right, with the fall of fiat money, or a few different fiat monies from different, um, you know, empires that ruled the, ruled the world, it's just also really hard to actually realize that we are in this same moment, right? Like the fact that something that is re that has repeated in history is actually happening now at the time that we are alive and that we can actually participate in it in a certain way that we can actually yeah. protect ourselves and help other people like that is so big you know it's so it's it, it, it's just really big and so that is one of the things i thought about a lot that that once you realize what bitcoin is and but then you put it in this historical perspective you instantly start doubting yourself like could this really be am i living in this moment in history like yeah duh like yeah. Ev every day is history right but but it, it's just again one of those points i think is nice also to share with other people that even for people like us who are totally into this like these thoughts exist you know you like you can be convinced of what this is but there are moments that you actually doubt yourself uh, or you know what yeah. this could be it's it feels like my life has become this like dreams i'm living in some like dream state almost where it's just like i don't know it's almost like the discovery of bitcoin is like hacking the matrix where you're just like oh my goodness like this is almost too good to be true like am i gonna wake up in some like my old shitty life like oh the pre-bitcoin era yeah, where, you like, cannot yeah, see you it know, anymore to, now <laughs> you know you have that like you're, you're combating the nihilism you know and we're all yeah. so broken inside because we know if we're not sociopathic and willing to lie cheat steal and kill we're at a game theoretic disadvantage within the marketplace and it's like depressing you know and so you know as far as i'm concerned and i genuinely believe this like this is the most exciting thing to be a part of as far as i can tell in all of known history like and if you understand 100%. that like holy motherfucking moly dude yeah. like how, how lucky are we is that like are you yes. kidding <laughs> yes we yes, are yes. riding this wave this is the most beautiful epic thing that has ever happened and that is just so so special man it's just mm -hmm. so fucking special yeah it, let's also I think address that we should allow ourselves to actually experience it, right? Like, yeah. yes, we are here, you know, and this is happening yeah. in some way or another. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So then on to the segue to the to the next thing we want to talk about is trading shit coins versus hodling your Bitcoin. I think we talked about, yeah, you know, when the price goes down, we buy more Bitcoin. I think we talked about the nihilistic world versus the optimistic world um i talked about that a lot actually with uh, eric Kaysen in one of the previous episodes that i love that like yes. nihilism versus optimism but trading shit coins versus hodling like for me it is i mean i i tried out crypto stuff i tried out nfts like i i did that because i wanted to experience it like how does this work you know figure all that stuff out made some money all into Bitcoin, but like hodling Bitcoin, I, my life is so much <laughs> easier, actually. Like I don't yeah, have to do anything is. where trading shit coins is like, you have to look for the next gem and the next team that's going to promise like, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm going to invest and just, you know, I'm going to try to sell after the first pump. Like, oh, now that I look back yeah. on that, like it gives you so much unnecessary mind space, but like, what are your thoughts on trading shit coins versus hodling? I think it's a BB. It's a before Bitcoin strategy. It's an old world strategy. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like it. So, yes, yeah, some people are capable of advancing their position, but it is unethical. And in, in the sense that, like, it's like cutting people off within traffic, like you're exerting a lot of energy, you're reducing your fuel consumption or whatever. If you're capable of, like, zooming through and changing lanes and get further down the road, like, I don't know, some people are capable of doing that. I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. Dude, I got wrecked in the 2018, you know, 
ICO. I was ICO. the exit. <laughs> they, I was the exit liquidity for a bunch of these scumbags just dumping on people. But I do think <laughs> yeah. this. I think that the whole ship coin, in the famous words of Crater, the whole ship coin movement is essentially a flawed. The value proposition is a flawed premise because it's if the price pumps on any of these then you're going to have a bunch of dummies going by Lambos. They're going to sell down their position to go and get catch their 1,000x to go buy some dollar-denominated, dollar-derivative, have some fun or whatever, right? And so that means that it's a trade. That means that you're, you have to exit your position and realize your gains or take profit, right? As like BitBoy Crypto would say, oh, hey, we're taking profit, right? And, yeah. And so... I think that that's the, one of the issues. I, I like a simple strategy. I think the simple strategy also offers you the highest probability of success. And in the famous words of Sailor and Bitcoin Prog 2023, trading Bitcoin is a... I wonder if he even meant to say this. I wonder if it just like whoop, slipped out of his mouth or if it was premeditated for his keynote. But trading Bitcoin is a sign of lesser intellect. If you understand how important Bitcoin is... It's too much risk. 1% of the days, so it's like nine, nine and a half, ten 10 days out of the year responsible for, I think it's 90% of the price moves. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, and so I think too, like if I were to sell some Bitcoin, I'm only selling Bitcoin for something that I absolutely immediately need. A couple of years ago, I was chatting with my dad during 2021's bull run and I was like, hey, look, Bitcoin's 50 grand. He's like, I'd sell it. You should sell it. I'm like, but for what? For what? Sell it for what? Yes. Like, I don't, I don't, do you know what I mean? Like, what am I going to sell it for? Because then if I sold it and I had dollars, now I got to buy the Bitcoin back, right? Like, and it doesn't yeah. make any sense. You could wake up tomorrow and make Turkey this a could meme. Have... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to make this you a meme. Know. Like, sell for what? Sell for what? Like, sell what are you going to do? And I 100% yeah. agree with you. Like, it should be for something that you actually want or want to experience. Totally. But not for dollars in your bank. Like, yeah. like you are this far, like then you are totally. going back. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And so I think um another issue with altcoins. So Bitcoin is the discovery of scarcity. It is the proof, it's the dominant proof of work protocol by a long shot. Like there is no second best, right? And so any of the other altcoins, so if you have an altcoin, let's say you're looking at like Ethereum or Solana or XRP, right? Like the whole idea that XRP is going to become the world reserve currency is because these dummies are paying for Google ads and they're, they got some false narrative. That's a false premise because do you think that the governments are going to buy coins, XRP from people when they could just pay their own team to write the new protocol? They would just write the new protocol. That and then if you're going to build a proof of work network or a smart chain on nothing why wouldn't you just build that as a layer two or layer three on the harder substance in the known universe mm. so it's an old world strategy of looking at cryptos as like this these this tech boom and you're going to be able to catch a thousand x on this tech stock but then once again like you're gonna have to sell your position and i also think about it and lastly i think about it in uh, as similar to what happened with the dot-com bubble, having a digital storefront, a website, is so revolutionary that created all of the speculative mania in companies like Pets.com. Some group of people start incorporated, they, they bought the domain Pets.com, and then they went through the SEC filings and started selling equity on Wall Street in their company that had no business, no earnings, no cash flow. They didn't have a functional business. And so that's just like having, having a, a honest, incorruptible distributed ledger is so revolutionary. Having a incorruptible protocol is so revolutionary that it's creating this mania where people are buying all of these these spin-off versions of it that really have no world use case. No, the market doesn't want them. People are trading these coins speculatively. You know, I love it when somebody tells me about their fucking shit coin and they're like, oh, yeah, we got this cool protocol and all this. I'm like, Does, where's, where's the use case? Like, are people using it? Uh, and yeah. how are you getting funded? Oh, oh, you have a coin. Oh, so you're dumping a bunch of pre-mined coins 
to fund something that the market is not paying for. If the market wants it, they'll fund it. If there is not something in the marketplace and the market wants it, they will bid the price up. There will be an economic incentive for entrepreneurs and capital to produce that and to satiate the demand. All of this stuff is just insiders just dumping their bags on you. It's like the whole thing well, is just a game. Such a it's a premise. game for most. It's a game for most people, right? But slot I, machines, um, are best dude. Yeah, but and I agree. Like, it's not. What is the incentive for a government to adopt XRP as some sort of currency where there's like nothing defensible about XRP or something like? There's nothing proprietary there. Um, that cannot be created by a government. Yeah, it's weird. I, I don't understand that people are still in this. It's kind of like this hope, you know, but I mean, like from my background, I've been in uh, startups and digital businesses for like 10 years. Like most, most of them fail, right? And I see the exact same. I say, I am in this WhatsApp group where people talk about Bitcoin, but crypto as well. And they're like, ooh, I found I found this little gem. It's only like, 1 million market cap and it's a great team look at this uh, like white paper or fucking uh, website and anything like dude like this is this is if this is Bitcoin just gambling didn't exist, you know like why, that yeah. speculative diversified portfolio strategy could make some sense let's say you have 10 grand and you yeah, put a you're betting bucks. on some sort of innovation yeah. in a certain totally. industry but you know i think yeah. uh the, the difference between bitcoin and crypto is you know bitcoin is a decentralized protocol and that represents like the discovery of digital scarcity digital property and crypto is just an attempt by startups to to build some sort of technology where their token fuels the use of their system, right? They say like, oh, we built this system and there's a token that, you know, you can exchange to make things work in this system. And that is what you can buy, that token. But but the adoption of the token doesn't represent uh, the usage of that system or that product, right? Because it's pure speculation on yeah. the value believe, of it. And people conflate I, that also. Yeah, well, and I believe that the, venture capitalists and the developers within the greater crypto market, the non-Bitcoin market, they have a, there's a distortion. There's like a broken feedback where they believe that the market wants what they're doing. They're being supported through the speculation where also because of the rate in which the currency is debasing and the, the extreme fuckness that's taking place amongst the populace in its time preference, people are YOLOing into this crap. Like in the famous words of American HODL, like you think a thousand X on her shit coin is going to change it. You only do that because you're so fucking nihilistic and the world's so fucked, dude. And so yeah. these developers and these venture capitalists are getting paid and they're making money and they think that the world is supporting them but it's because of the brokenness within the world. And so it's yeah. just this it's entirely- It's not the value of their premise. product, no. Yeah. It's not the well, value of the product or the system. it's also a way to system. navigate around the SEC rules. And I'm, I'm a free market maximalist. I'm not uh, gonna be a promoter. It's like when Saylor was talking, talking to Lex Friedman and Lex is steel manning the shit out of him. And he's like, oh, well, I don't wanna think about attorneys and rules and whatever. And Saylor's like, hey, hey, how about let's look at the SEC laws from a different perspective. How about let's look at through the biblical perspective of thou shall not lie, cheat, or steal. <laughs> like, that's what it is. That's what SEC yeah. filings are for. Disclosing where your money came from. Disclosing what, wh who owns what percentage of what shares you have there. And so I think that the whole greater crypto market is a way to navigate around that. Let's look at, lastly, I'll say, let's look at Ethereum. Famously, Cat Purse Boy sold off billions of dollars of Ethereum and then tells the world, well, hey, it's great financial planning. Well, hold on. Mm -hmm. If your protocol is so great, why are you selling down your, your Ethereum? Like, wouldn't you want to hold it? Like, if you just think about it for any longer than two seconds, at least that's for <laughs> yes. me, you, you realize yeah. that all of the other stuff is garbage, dude. There's no second yeah. best. It's so that's great I'm selling it. Yeah. What are you talking about? Okay. So lastly, let's talk about the subject that is uh, dear to your heart, I think. The broken incentives of 
our food and, and like how that how the bro- how broken incentives wrecked our food and medicine yes so uh i'll give you the most comprehensive but condensed version of my perspective there or my life story and why i have my perspective so i'll build the foundation then i'll share what my perspective is now that i'm 39 years old and through the lens of bitcoin develop greater understanding so my parents divorced when i was at a young age i was five years old the reason that my parents divorced i think partially was due to societal struggles relative to the boom bust cycles within the economy as a result of the modern monetary system that we have the keynesian economy and <clears throat> my mother remarried to a psychiatrist this guy's a doctor a degree no alcohol, no tobacco, upstanding individual. My family's of, you know, was a classy, upstanding, productive members of society. Uh, no physical abuse, no molestation, no craziness, right? Um, my mother remarries a few years after, or actually quite quickly after my parents' divorce. She mar- remarries a psychiatrist. The psych- psychiatrist works within the prison system in Southern California, and he prescribes pharmaceuticals to inmates within the prison system. So he's prescribing all these antipsychotics and anti-anxiety and antidepressants. And he's a credible figure within our society. Here's a doctor, and my mother ends up getting into antidepressants. For 15 years of her life, she took antidepressants. While she went back to school and received a doctorate degree in sociology and became a professor of sociology. And so my father, my biological father, is a is a structural engineer, licensed architect, general contractor. So he draws, builds and does nice houses, subdivides, restaurants, commercial buildings. Uh, stepfather's a psychiatrist. My mother's a doctorate degree in sociology. So at a very young age, we had a lot of deep philosophical conversations on our like family ski and snowboard trips. And my dad, he's not a dummy. This guy's a successful individual. And so my mo- mother for 15 years, though, starts taking pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals, not like she's not into Oxycontin and snorting Klonopins or doing crazy like things. She's just popping antidepressants and anti-anxiety and she goes to the she has her own psychiatrist she goes to and hey i don't feel good well let me give you this blah 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 so in my early teens i discovered cannabis some of my friends were smoking cannabis i smoked some cannabis i'm like wait a second like you know this isn't some dirty dingy drug this is just a plant like why is this illegal but all these crazy pharmaceuticals are legal why is it you can go buy alcohol and tobacco but you can't buy cannabis and because of the deep philosophical conversations that I was a part of as a result of my mother getting her doctorate degree in sociology, I was, you know, I'm a 10, 12 year old while she's writing her doctorate thesis. And so we have these fun conversations as a family. I was primed to think outside the box and deeper, abstract, philosophical, long term thoughts. And I developed a big mistrust of, for the system because it just kind of there was just things didn't make sense. And it just, you know, started to question the system. And then I started to get shunned and disliked, you could say, by my teachers and parents, friends who said, oh, Eric, you're so smart and you have all this potential. Why are you into weed, you little dirty drug addict? And like, you know, I had an issue with the, the school system. Now I call them government indoctrination camps. Like, why am I going to have to, to go home and do a bunch of busy work? When I can pass your test, give me the information. I'll, uh, I will learn what I need to learn and then I'll come back and I'll take the test. But you want me to go home and spend all night long just doing busy work like you could get fucked. And so I essentially dropped out of high school by the time I was a senior in high school, developed an affinity for cannabis, no other drugs, you know, and I just, you know, kind of started doing my own thing. My mother ended up committing suicide at the eight when I was 20 years old. The pharmaceuticals that she had been taking for 15 years of her life didn't solve any of her problems. And I used to tell people like, why, you you know, I used to ask her like, why are you taking those pills? You know, your ancestors 100,000 years ago that like lived in a cave who went out to the forest and couldn't find food. They didn't go back to the cave and say, hey, I'm really depressed because I didn't get any food today. Let me just pop these fucking pills. No, they did something to change their circumstances. And so I developed an enormous aversion to this patented 
funny, like overprescribed pharmaceutical industrial complex. And as a result of losing my mother at a young age and other family members died as a result of taking these pharmaceuticals. And it wasn't fentanyl. It wasn't Oxycontin overdoses. Like these are people who who struggled at, because the, the pills weren't solving their problems. Now, I do think that technological advancement within the medical industry has fixed things in our society, antibiotics, so on and so forth. But I developed a huge mistrust and it drove me actually into the cannabis industry. At the age of 25 years old, I'd been selling cars for a Toyota store for a couple of years in my early 20s. I, and it was a fun job. I learned a lot about people and negotiating and whatever. And it was easy to sell Toyotas because Toyotas sell themselves and whatever. And someone invited me from Southern California to Northern California. A friend I went to high school with uh, invited me to come up and trim some cannabis because they knew I had an affinity for cannabis. And I took that opportunity. I came up and I started trimming. I trimmed for a season and I started working for the grower the following year. I lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere by myself for two years with no cell phone and no internet service. It was at 26, 25, 26 years old. It was quite an interesting time wow. in my life. And so for me, I wanted to see cannabis prohibition ended. I wanted to put an end to that. I wanted to contribute in my revolutionary way as the Fuck you to the big pharmaceutical industrial complex that, as far as I'm concerned, had a hand in killing some of my family members. Every time I bag a pound and sell it into the marketplace, it's a middle finger to what now I understand it is the fiat world. And thank you to Jeff Booth and to Michael Saylor. I would give them the most credit. And then Breedlove and Kaysen and whole, I could go down the list of just all of these just epic contributors to the Bitcoin knowledge base that I have been privy to. I understand now that as the deflationary forces take place within the market, in order to hedge yourself against prices falling to the marginal cost of production, you either have to you have to essentially build a regulatory moat around a sector within the marketplace. You have to get a patent and be the only one who can produce this thing. You have to keep your patients sick and dependent upon the pharmaceuticals that you're selling them. You can't it's like a uh, a patient cured as a customer lost. Well, that incentive is only because the expansion of the monetary units, the Keynesian lie, the modern monetary trash that we're being forced to use means that the deflationary forces, we push things, prices down on things as we create things more abundantly that the marketplace wants paired with the inflationary forces in our monetary system requiring prices to go up on everything, it means yes. that the margins are perpetually harder to make. And in order to make those margins, you have to put the proverbial knee on the neck of the marketplace and exploit them. And so the exploitative nature of the broken incentives within our monetary system killed part of my family as far as I'm concerned. It's because the, so the, the incentive is to figure out how to per extract perpetually more margin. And, you know, Sailor says money is economic energy. I think about that. It's literally life force. So you have a yes. broken paradigm, which also stemmed from the physicality of gold was very limited. One of the banking bloodlines, great, you know, guys, many, many, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago or whatever, this guy figured out, hey, I'm going to house the gold and I'm going to issue certificates. And it made sense to use the certificate and travel to another country and buy land than to have to cart your gold around because some guy will just prick you and take it. In Amsterdam, this was, yes. Yeah. So that made sense, though. That was a technological <laughs> advancement. We needed that. Yeah. It made sense. Well, that now, because everything pre-Bitcoin has been pretty easily corruptible, led into yeah. a corrupted marketplace with a corrupted, broken monetary system. That's toxic. And so that creates a broken incentive. The incentive is to figure out how to extract more. Then I'll, I'll kind of wrap it at this. But a good example is, is there's two companies within the states that have access to the patent to create insulin. So insulin is very profitable. If we had a free market where there wasn't a regulatory moat built around that sector within the marketplace, that's a huge economic incentive for entrepreneurs and capital to flow into that sector of the market to make a bunch of insulin, making insulin really cheap and abundant, bringing its price down. Well, I see it. It feels like I see a story you know, or hear something. Some kid who's 25 years old gets dropped from his parents' medical insurance, has been just 
poisoned and gaslit and lied to with the food pyramid and all the sugar and all the garbage that they've been eating. So now they have a, they're, they're diabetic. They can't store fat. They can't, they can't, their body doesn't function properly. They're dependent upon this insulin. So you got this food industrial complex that's just getting paid to just wreck people. You got the medical industrial complex getting paid to just keep fucking, keep them alive barely. They get dropped from their parents' insurance and they can't afford insulin and they're dying. So that the insulin is very profitable and people need it to live. Well, that would be a huge yeah. incentive for entrepreneurs to produce insulin, but they can't because there's yeah. a regulatory moat built around it because the companies that, and so here's the, and I'll, this is, I'll segue to one last thing that's just so epically beautiful about Bitcoin. The board of directors of these companies like Nestle, that's going to go drill a well in some impoverished part of the world. And instead of giving the water to the people who don't have clean water that are dying from basic diseases and bathing and drinking water out of the streets, instead of giving water to help these people, they're selling water to people who don't even have any money. Instead of, instead of that, at the end of the year, well, okay, because these people, these corporations are made up of people. It's like Jeff Boo says, there is no they, it's just us. It's made up of people that are serving their self-interest and they have a fiduciary responsibility to provide shareholder value. They want to keep their earnings, their cash flows, their corporations successful in a marketplace where there's all this competition. And so because of the accounting changes at the end of the year, the path of least resistance, the most energy efficient way to get the most because of the game theory is, is for these corporations to sweep their surplus in the Bitcoin instead of perpetually exploiting. And that's a big deal. So now that Trojan horse of freedom and abundance for all is in the castle. And here's the other to thing dive too. Into that. D dive into that. Wait. So what you say is they have all this excess capital by yep. basically abusing humans in a, you know, whatever totally. way. That is their incentive, right? Yep. But now you say like there's there is an alternative solution. So yep. instead of um, actually helping the inflationary forces by keeping the food bad, by yep. um, not allowing people to have certain innovations on certain drugs, for example, what you mentioned about you know the access to insulin. And I say, like, because there is another, a better way to keep the value of the cash that you generated through this, um, you know, malign business, basically, um, yeah. their incentives get switched. So they actually go from a short, short time preference, right? Yep. Abusing, consuming, abusing other uh, energy from other humans to perpetual a long time long t yeah exactly to a long time preference which is basically yep. saving the value they already have in bitcoin that's what you're saying right yeah and so let's look at sailor with micro strategy you got a fiscally responsible conservative individual who has 500 million dollars on the balance sheet COVID hits the government now starts debasing the currency at hyper rate he knows he has an existential crisis if you're a publicly traded corporation and you're in his position with a surplus you can essentially do three things you can buy back your own shares you can buy shares in another company or you can pay out that surplus in the form of a dividend or you can convert it to a property, gold, whatever, right? And so a commodity. The most, the way to get the most is, is to take that surplus and buy Bitcoin now because the, your, the, the appreciation that takes place on your balance sheet is it happens at such a fast rate that you're providing the most, the most shareholder value by stacking the sats than you are by either getting gobbled up by a big, he could have sold all of the shares within, he could just sold the company to Microsoft, been consolidated and rolled up, right? And so you, the pre-Bitcoin, yeah. the strategy is, is become the biggest fish or become gobbled, gobbled up by the biggest fish and take an exit position that's large enough that allows you to become a contillionaire and live off of the equity that is found as the result of the depreciation of the currency or the expansion of the currency units. And now corporations are incentivized to get the most, to provide the most shareholder value come the end of the yes. year to stack sats. And that is yeah. also a decentralizing force and not a centralizing force because also if you're a corporation and your valuation goes up, you're incentivized to go leverage 
your valuation in the form of taking on more debt and going and buying, I don't know, more warehouses like Amazon is doing. In the in Sailor's case, he's destroyed the paradigm. All your models are destroyed. He's created a feedback loop where as he keeps stacking Bitcoin, the value of his company keeps going up. They have to, because of fractional reserve lending, keep lending more shitty fiat into the marketplace. He goes to the <laughs> yeah. banks and goes, hey, guys, I'm a fiscally responsible guy. We got a cash flow. Pass it over here. They do. They keep loaning him money and he keeps putting it into Bitcoin. He's like, you fucking dummies. And then the value of his company keeps going up and he keeps borrowing more Bitcoin and buy, or more money and buying more Bitcoin. And so he's going to own the fucking whole world if these other corporations don't start doing it. And that's exciting because now instead of Nestle going and drilling a well in some town in Africa and selling these people who have barely any money water, they're going to stack sats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then so... It's just such a big deal, man. Bitcoin is such a big deal. And the more and more I think about it, the more and more enthralled I become, the more excited I get, the less depressed or less worried or less concerned I am, the more grateful that I am. I'm bursting at the seams with motherfucking gratitude, dude. This is such a special thing. It's so precious, dude. I can barely believe it. Yeah. Big what deal. I love is that I hope we can get also this opportunity to fix like that broken food and the, the fix those medicines, right? I love the example that you have. And I use that a lot as well. The, the deflationary force of technology, right? Uh, right. That will push prices down. I think nobody can argue against that, right? Like rationally, that's a great thought. Like the more technology improves, the more prices fall to the, to the margin, uh, marginal cost of production. Right. So then I always ask this question, why did a bread cost 25 cents and it's now four dollars or five dollars? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. It should actually no. be free. It should be like, uh, you know, in this like sci fi uh, show or we had a we had a show here where people had like like a uh, like a pill. And they would put in the water and it would pop out as a bread, right? Like we yeah. should be there and it should be totally. free for everyone. Yep. And it should be like nutritious. It should even be better than the bread of 40 years ago. But currently totally. we have four, four or five dollar or euro breads that are nutritionally probably worse than the bread of 40 yeah. or 50 years ago, right? So we are basically going back in time. And why are we going back in time? Because this deflationary technology force is battling the inflationary um, yes. money. And that is what the money does. The money removes the incentives to yeah. actually innovate, to make it better because it it flips, it gives you perverse incentives to abuse the position that you already have, right? As you, as you just mentioned with Nestle, for yeah. example. And so, yeah, I think that is like a, that, that's a very good illustration and also explanation that you can use to explain to people because most people do think it's weird that it's funny that we joke about the bread was 25 cents right I, yeah yeah and then if someone says well everything becomes more expensive then you can ask well why like give yeah. me a logical explanation of you know why why is that so those those things i think anyone can eventually understand like you, you can use that to break it, it down kind of long and hard though like i had to wire new neuro pathways to understand it because it's a new way of looking at the world and you're you don't understand necessarily until you think about those two opposing forces those two opposing forces mean that your margins are perpetually harder to make your cost yes. of living is going up denominated in dollars but you're experiencing wage deflation as a producer of anything you just have different mm. flavors of the same thing. So you're incentivized yeah. to either monopolize and exploit or shitify whatever it is that you're making. And Bitcoin inverts that. And that's yes, just a, it's just a really big deal. Like I, I tell people two things when they say, hey, you know what? The, the plundering psychopathic entities, you could say, are just going to continue <laughs> to plunder in perpetuity forever. And they don't understand yeah. that we've discovered incorruptibility. Well, I'll ask them this question. Why don't we live in the Roman Empire? Like, why is it we live in the States? Why is it the United States? Why are you in California? Why are we in Texas? Why, why mm. don't we live in Rome? Why didn't Rome just take over the whole world and then just run the whole world? Because the business model isn't sustainable. Because yeah. that centralizing force of debasing to fund your plunder eventually breaks. And another thing that I'll ask people is, is, 
why is it that a house that you live in or that you just bought that's 50 years old, that's shitty and has asbestos ceiling and needs to have a roof replaced all the time, why is it that that house costs 10x, 20x what it did 50 years ago? It's because the value of the house is denominated in another variable, a moving metric, the dollar, which is losing its value so fast, it's creating the optical illusion of price appreciation or value yes. appreciation. Your house yeah. is losing value like your used car is. You just can't see it because there's an optical illusion taking place. So while people have, like I love how Sailor broke it down in Bitcoin Prague. He says that essentially if you have paid for real estate, let's say you have a million dollar piece of property, it costs on average 1% of the value of the property annually to maintain the property. And if you live in a jurisdiction with 1% real estate tax, you're losing 2% of the value of the property every year. If you equate that to a half-life, you have a 35-year half-life. You lose half of the value of the paid $4 million property over 35 years. People just don't see it, though, because they think they're getting wealthier, and they are if you denominate their wealth in dollars. But if you look at how many dollars they have relative to how many dollars are within the system, they're actually getting poorer. And so that's why yes. if you have one out of 21 million you can depend upon it's also it's a it's a constant within a world full of nothing but variables it like allows us in this very abstract kind of way to solve for something you've never been able to solve for ever in all of known history yeah 100%. i love it man yeah that's awesome man i love it too all right last last part and then we can wrap it up almost two hours man this has been really fun man over yeah, man, we had over a thousand viewers on the live on Twitter, so that's Incredible. fun. Incredible! Oh my goodness! Thank all you right. to all of everybody who watches. By the way, yeah, it's awesome. Um, last last uh, topic is uh, someone sent this on Twitter. Can you talk a bit about the synergy between Bitcoin and cannabis and how each could benefit the other in the long run? Yeah, so I think it ties into the incentive, the broken incentives to where it's because of the fiat paradigm where your margins are perpetually harder to make it's the shootification of everything it's like read jimmy bong song's book fiat ruins everything because your margins are harder to make because we live in a fundamentally deflationary world that means that you have to do unethical things to success succeed essentially it creates this sociopathology or something it's like uh yeah just a breaks the brain of some people or the people who are willing to plunder become the people who get the most within the marketplace. They have to build a regulatory moat around yeah. some sector in the marketplace. And it, and it incentivizes people to create some cheap, shitty widget. It incentivizes planned obsolescence where you're, you're a corporation and you make a widget and you're planning on that widget failing so that other people can, so that your customers can continue to come back and buy more and buy more. And so with cannabis, I think cannabis is a very powerful medicinal herb. It's one of the most powerful herbs, most powerful medicines on the planet, both spiritually, emotionally, and physically. I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm in Humboldt County. I can't even tell you how many people and how many stories I've heard of people using cannabis oil and they've healed stage four cancers. Cannabis, there are constituents and molecules within that the cannabis plant produces that perform a process called apoptosis, which essentially that molecule can go into a cancer cell, it can penetrate the cell membrane barrier, it can kill the cancer cell without damaging healthy cells around it. So it's kind of like the opposite of chemotherapy, where chemotherapy can kill a cancer cell, but it's kind of like dropping a nuclear bomb on an area where you essentially kill everything. And people who take chemotherapy become very, very sick and then they will kill the cancer and then they have to recover from this essentially just mass extermination of all the biology that lives on us and within us and it damages healthy cells including and sometimes it doesn't even kill the cancer cells so uh there is some some special things there with cannabis that i think over time and also there's this monetary incentive as the governments become more broke because it's a government to basis its currency it makes its operating cost goes up requiring either further taxation or further debasement so it creates this broken feedback loop and so kind of where i feel like bitcoin is this trojan horse that everybody who's economically and every challenged entity or every entity that's economically challenged is going to bring this in 
I think the United States government is, is also going to de- reschedule and decriminalize or legalize cannabis because they're broken. They need the tax revenue. And also, so then that like, I don't know, cannabis too, for me, it really brings, uh, m- brings me into a state of being really present. And I think that we get really bombarded with all these stressors and things in our life that cause us to be too worried about the future and you're very anxiety ridden. You're too concerned about the past and you're really guilt ridden. And I blah, 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 blah. Cannabis has this meditative state. And I think that that helps people emotionally and spiritually. It's kind of very, it's recalibrating in some interesting way. And so I think the ethos within cannabis is very similar to the ethos within Bitcoin where it's essentially something that the world wants that you can't stop. How do you stop people from growing this plant that you could just sprout from this little teeny little seed, right? How do you stop people from wanting a fair and open and decentralized protocol, a form of property that nobody can violate, confiscate, debase, et cetera? But I think there's a lot of parallels there. But I think, yeah, just the, the broke state of the government and the banking system is going to is bringing solvency in by stacking sats that's how you get the most and i think that the the need for because you can if you're the government you can get funded in two ways through taxes or through debasements it's both a form of property confiscation both of those are an incentive to bring cannabis out of prohibition and then bring the freedom virus which is bitcoin into the into the castle skates and I think that both of those things are good for people who want them. Also, if you're not into cannabis, you don't like cannabis, fair enough. That's all cool. Don't go pop pills. Drink alcohol. Do whatever you whatever feeds your existence and makes you feel good. As long as it's not harming others, I think you should have the right to do it. And so both of them, as far as I'm concerned, and embody this error of freedom and a freedom to express and experience what you want with this existence, which is so precious and so special. And I think that it is unfair, unethical for some centralized, corrupted authority to tell you what you can do or not do if it's not harming other people. So, yeah. That's an epic ending. Yeah, man. Well, I'm awesome, just man. so grateful to have had this conversation. I really enjoy talking with you. I enjoyed our time in Madeira um dude yeah, it was man. so fun it was so good I, and again i i said this on an, another podcast uh, actually on the high hash rate uh, guys with the high hash rate guys shout out like, to those guys i love those guys yeah yeah totally anyone who is into bitcoin how much doesn't really matter like i would invite everyone to join like a real life event meet other people you can yeah. go alone. I flew alone to <laughs> to an island. You know, like you, you will meet other people that are into the same thing and they will challenge you to share your thinking and your ideas and you will have amazing conversations. Like the, the entire energy is so much fun and I think it's palpable to also feel um, and realize that this is a huge thing that connects people all around the world. So it was awesome seeing you. It was awesome having this conversation. We'll definitely do this again in the future. Anytime. And, uh, thanks so much, buddy. I loved it. Yeah. Thank you. And shout out. Thank, thank you. you to all the people watching the live stream. And I, you know, to all my followers, I'm kind of in a little bit of disbelief by, you know, my, my, my Bitcoin journey here. I just, I'm, I don't know. So grateful for everybody. So thank you. Everyone. Just, just, we're just dudes. We're just sharing yeah. whatever we're experiencing and thinking. And I think you're doing an amazing job, man. You're in, you're an inspiration to me. So thanks again. And uh, yeah, same to you. let's talk soon. Cheers, man. Yes. Yes. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.